today. It's also nice to, to be on preaching roster because you get elders carrying stuff for you. You also get to wear these nice contraptions and talk to the church. But better still, you get to share with the people of God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, your people are here. They're here to listen to your word. Please speak to them and speak to me as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So our sermon today is titled, Time and Money. As you can see, oh, there we go. And I'll base my sermon from the scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 26. It is also repeated in Psalms chapter 24, if you were paying attention to the scripture reading, this tells me there's a certain emphasis that God wanted us to know. Uh, He's constantly reminding us, both in the Old and in the New Testament, that the earth is his and everything else that is in it. So let's go to... uh, Genesis chapter 25 talks about a very common story, that of Jacob and Esau. 
Jacob and Esau were born uh, by who were their parents? Isaac and? Rachel. No. Rebecca. Okay, I thought this, this story was common. <laughs> okay, I guess I have to tell you this story. Okay, Isaac and Rebecca gave birth to twins. And their names were Jacob and Esau. Okay? All right, now we're on the same page. Okay, moving on. Who was born first? Esau. Okay. So because he was born first, he, uh, he deserved the birthright. Okay. Do we know what the birthright is? What a birthright is? Yes. What's birthright? It's the exactly. So there were two things that were involved in the birthright back then. One of them was that you got the spiritual blessing which meant that the Messiah was going to come within your inheritance. He's going to be your posterity. That was a spiritual blessing. There was also a possession blessing, which is a material blessing, which meant you got a large portion of the father's inheritance. So as we know, Jacob coveted the spiritual blessing. He, he wanted Jesus to come after his posterity. And so, what did he do? Um, Esau, one day, was coming from the field. He was a very fieldsy uh, kind of guy. He liked to hunt. And that's why his father was, uh, that's why he was his father's favorite, because he loved to hunt, and his father loved the taste of game, the, 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 the taste of, of meat. So he was his father's uh, favorite. On the other hand, Jacob was his mother's favorite because he liked to stay home and cook, which would be common even in today. So um, one day, Esau is coming from the field, and he was famished. So he, he gets home, and there was a nice aroma happening in the kitchen. Um, just, just imagine your best meal cooking as you get home. It's smelling even... From, from the main street. He gets there, and then Jacob, and then he says to Jacob, you know, I am famished. You give me some of your soup, your bean soup, we believe. And uh, this was Jacob's opportunity to claim or deceive him to give him his birthright, because he's always, co remember, he's always coveted this birthright. So then he goes ahead and uh, says, well, you know, if you want some of my soup, what should you do? Give me your birthright. At that point, he's hungry. He's not thinking about birthright. What, he actually said, what is that birthright worth to me if I'm going to die of hunger? So at that point, he had no idea he was selling his birthright. So he gave that away. Um, moving on, when the father was getting old. He, he was becoming blind. Uh, as we can see, most of us have uh, started wearing glasses. At that time, I, I don't think they wore glasses, <laughs> but if you start seeing yourself wearing glasses, and I wear glasses too sometimes, uh, you're getting there. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so moving on, we realize that uh, Isaac was, was getting blind, and he, he knew that his time to die was coming. So he decided, this is the right time to bless my son. So he decided to ask his older son, Esau, go and do the thing that you always do to me. Go and get me some game, some nice uh, meat so I can eat and drink before I give you the blessing. While this was happening, uh, Rebecca was listening, and Rebecca loved Jacob and wanted Jacob to get this blessing. And so he decided to come up with a ruse. Like, hey, let's, this is our opportunity. This is our time. So he tells Jacob to go and get him a lamb, 
kill it, and she's going to prepare it the way she, know, he, she knows the father loves it. Now, Esau was a very hairy man. And uh, if you wanted to impersonate Esau, you had to put on a lot of hairy stuff. And so they put on um, the, the goat skin. Is it lamb skin, goat skin? Same thing. They put it on, covering all the way up to, to the neck and the hands. And it was, uh, Esau also had a distinct smell because he was an outside person. And so the mother knew this and decided to, uh, to, imperson- to get jo- uh, Jacob to impersonate his brother so he could get the blessing. They prepared the meal quickly. It was done. And uh, Jacob presents himself to his father and says, uh, Father, I'm here. And the father asked, who are you? And he said, I am Esau, your son. And he said, are you sure? Come here, let let me feel you. Because he heard that the voice sounded like Jacob. So he comes closer, he feels him. He had actually put on Esau's clothes as well. So the father explains, "I I I can smell Esau. I can feel that you feel like Esau, but the voice is that of uh, Jacob. Are you sure you're Esau? Yes, father, I am Esau. So he deceived his father as well. As a result, when Esau came, the blessing has already been given to Jacob. So Esau comes back home, and then he says, Father, I'm here. You know, uh, I'm here with the game. And it was already too late. But we have to remember that while the, the children were in the womb, they were kicking, and Rebekah went to God because he was worried, what's going on in my stomach? And God explained to him that you have two nations in your stomach, and these nations are going to be against each other. This was already predicted. And the younger is going to rule over the older. So she has already been told this. And so I imagine when this time came and she saw that the father is about to blessing to bless the older son, she's like, no, God, you, you're doing the wrong thing, and decides to take matters in her own hands and get her younger son blessed. Anyway, so uh, because Esau came home and his blessing was gone. He was very angry and he started to plot to kill his young brother. The mother heard this and decided to to tell his son to flee, to run away. And the idea was you're running away under the pretense of you going to look for a wife. Go to my brothers. So Jacob picked up his stuff. Actually, the Bible actually says all he had was a staff in his hand. He left home empty-handed. So remember that this is going to be, uh, this is going to work in, in our sermon uh, today. So while he was away, Jacob, in his, on his way and is now alone at night, he fell asleep. He realized what mistake he had made. So he repented to God and he prayed. He cried himself to sleep only with a rock on his, as a pillow. And he prayed to God, asking for forgiveness. And while he was sleeping, he had a dream. And the dream was that there was a ladder. And the ladder was comprised of angels going up and down. And while the angels were going up and down, he heard the voice of God. God spoke to him. And he reminded him, told him he had forgiven him. And he reminded him that he had forgiven him and he is going to continue blessing him. He was going to be a great nation and assured him that he didn't have to be worried. And because of that, Jacob decided to promise God that if God is going to do this, so that's, that's what leads us to our verse here, Genesis 28, Verse 20, then Jacob made a vow saying, 
if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey uh, that I am taking and, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And, all, and of all that you, have, uh, you give me, I will give you a tenth, which is also called a tithe. Now, do we know what the word tithe means? Okay, I've already told you what tithe means. <laughs> we wanted to find out if Fort McMurray knows what the word tithe means. And so we went out. So we're going to watch a video and, and, and see if Fort McMurray knows what tithe means. Hi. Hi. I wanted to know if you guys know what the word tithe means. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and how much time do you spend on social media or just on the internet in general? Um, I'd say at least two to three hours a day. Two to three hours a day? Yeah. Hi. Is, do you know what tithe means? The word tithe? No, I don't know. Okay. And then the. Like tithe sorry? It tithe spelled T I T H E, tithe? No. No. And then we wanted to find out how much time you spend on social media, on just the internet in general in a day. I have a long distance relationship. <laughs> so I spend like eight hours. Eight hours? Yeah. Okay. My, okay. Hi, Janelle. Hi. Do you know what the word tithe means? T I T H E? No. You guys could tell me how much how time. much time do you spend on Two. the internet <laughs> per day? Per day. Uh, probably an hour or two. And social media? Probably an hour or two. Okay. Thanks. Welcome. Hi Beverly. Yeah. Hi. Do you know what the word tide means? No. Do you how much time do you spend on social media? Uh, four hours. How about on the internet in general? Majority of the time, anyways. Like, can use my phone all the time. Okay. Facebook. Thanks. T I T H E, tithe. No. No. Okay. How much time do you spend on social media? Or just on the internet in general? Oh, internet's different than social media. Yeah. I say yeah. social media like an hour, an hour and a half a day, but internet like all throughout. Okay, and Tiffany? Social media, probably about an hour, hour and a half. Internet, probably a little bit more. A couple, three hours a day, probably. Okay. All right, thank God. I need a picture of us. Hi, Shelly. Hi. Do you know what the word like, tithe means? Tithe? Tithe, T-I-T-H-E. No. How much time do you spend on the internet? A day? Mm-hmm. Probably two hours. And on social media? An hour. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay, Scott. Yeah. Did you know what the word uh, tithe means? Tithe uh, means uh, 10%. Well, most people think it's like 10% of your money, but we kind of believe it's 10% of, you know, everything. 10% of your time, 10% of your day, 10% of, um, yeah. Your earnings, your resources. Er, yeah, well, your earnings are is, is the money and, and such, but okay. yeah, beyond that. Cool. I have another question for you. Okay. How much time do you spend on uh, social media per day? Way more than 10%. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. Okay. Um, like a couple of hours a day? No, I'd say probably about an hour and a probably an hour a day, maybe. Okay. Cool. Maybe an hour and a half. <laughs> okay, cool. If I was really truthful. <laughs> an hour and a half. About an hour and a half. <laughs> okay. Cool. Okay. So evidently, a lot of us don't know what the word tight means. And so, I thought it was important for us to, to study into it. So where did Jacob learn about this word tithe? Where did he learn to give a tenth to the Lord? We can find our, our answer. Yes, really? 
from his grandfather, Abraham, yes. So uh, we can find out that in uh, Genesis chapter 14, it, sta it states that, and Melchizedek was the priest of the Most High God, and he, we were talking about Abraham, gave him tithes of all. After Abraham came to f uh, from fighting an army, uh, we know that Abraham did go to war, right? Yes. yes. After he came from fighting from the army, he decided to give a tenth to the Lord to give him a, a thanksgiving offering. And he gave that tithe to Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? We don't hear too much about Melchizedek except that he was a high priest and he was king of Salem. Uh, you will learn more if you go into Hebrews chapter 7. It then tells you a little bit more of who uh, Melchizedek is and that he is a type of Christ, type of Jesus. And so as they gave a tithe to Melchizedek, it was, it was sort of a, a representation of how we today would give a tithe to Jesus. So why should we take time why should we talk about time and money? Uh, if you notice in the video, we were asking people how much time they spend on, on social media. In North America, the average household, well, not even household, the average American's debt is $225,000 debt. And this individual is earning an average of $40,000 uh, per year. Now, in Fort McMurray, this is definitely a different thing. Each American holds an average of about four credit cards, holding uh, about 15,000 in, in debt, okay? Interest about 14.5, uh, 95% on average. Student loans, $31,000. The Mercedes bans outside. $30,000. Mortgage debt, an average of $147,000. Here in Fort McMurray, it's definitely way more than that. Okay, times three. And about 59% of Americans have less than $500 in savings. Now, talking about time, I also went and researched and found out these stats from Digital trend, uh, Trends, that's the website. Americans check their Facebook about 17 times per day. Not just Facebook, but Twitter. In Thailand, Argentina, Malaysia, and our friends in South Africa, have more than twice that much, 40 times. But Americans are by far the most in their data usage. They spend about four and a half hours per day using their data devices. We're up on an average of 15 hours in a day, some more, if you, especially those that work 12 hours a day, and sleep about eight hours. So that's a third of our time that we're spending on our phones. How popular are we that we have to spend that much time, a third of our day on phones? So what portion of our income belongs to God, or even our time? Our time and our income. What portion of it belongs to God? hundred percent, that's correct. And, and yet, all he asks from us is 10%. And of our time, he only asks one of seven days, which is the Sabbath day, right? He says, give it to me to rest. We find a, a verse that will support that statement from Leviticus chapter 27. All the tithe is the Lord's. So what does God do with our tithe? Does, uh, is God afraid to go on, um, on social welfare? So, so he wants us to give him some of that money? So why does God ask us of the tithe? Numbers chapter 18, verse 21. I have given 
the children of Levi, all the tents in Israel, for an inheritance for their service which they served. The tithes of the children of Israel I have given to the Levites to inherit. Who are the Levites? Do we have Levites here today? Who? Billy is a Levite. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live on the gospel. So uh, at the end of the day, I'm going to stand over there and uh, I'll be collecting a bit of a tithe. Is that okay? No? Okay, so our pastors benefit from the tithe that we give. And so when we give, the money, the way the Adventist church has, has organized this is our money is collected here and it goes to the conference. Now the conference hires pastors and pays them a certain uh, salary, which I believe is the, is the same across the board, whether you have a congregation of 100 people or you have a congregation of 1,000 people, you are paid the same amount. And I think this is how God designed it. So that when, we, when the preacher comes up here to preach, number one, he's not going to be afraid to speak to the poor or to the rich because he wants them to give a little more. He, he doesn't have anyone to step on, right? So he's going to preach the word... Uh, as it is. And the other reason why the preachers should, should benefit, benefit from this is, do they only come here to preach one day? Is that, is that all they do? Yes. Pastors are supposed to be in the work of God 24-7. So even on the Sabbath day, they are working. And we don't want our, want our pastor going to a shift and coming back here and, and falling asleep, do we? What amazing promise does God make if we give our tithes? Okay, so Malachi chapter 10, uh, 3, verse 10 says, Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now. So he wants us to prove him. Bring your tithes and prove God. Uh, prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour out a blessing that there shall be not enough room in it to receive. So God here is promising that when we tithe, he's going to give us more. He not only wants to give us or bless us with more, but he also wants to prolong the life of the things that we already own. Have you... I have noticed, I will, uh, I will give myself as a testimony. I have noticed that when I gave uh, to the Lord faithfully, my car didn't die as often. I didn't have to do as many repairs at home. And I didn't fall into these financial uh, unfortunate events as, as often as when I was not as faithful. And so God wants us to to give as much. Think of uh, a person like, the other thing is God wants to see that our priorities are straight. So when he, when he, when we give back to God, it's not that he wants to, he cannot do without, but it's actually for us. Think of uh, Solomon, for example. There were rich people in the Bible. Solomon's priorities were straight. When God asked him what he wanted, what did he ask for? Did he say, I want uh, give about $2 million or $800 million? What was that? Uh, the lottery, that, that, that was in the U.S. not too long ago. Powerball. Did he ask for a Powerball? No. He asked for wisdom. And because his priorities were straight, God gave him everything. There is no man that will be ever richer 
than Solomon himself. So when we tithe, who really receives our money? We've spoken a little bit about this, but in essence, if we look in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. So when we are giving, we're actually giving to God. So does it matter what uh, Vili has decided is going to be the paint in the house in the, when they decide to paint the church? Should that determine whether you give or not? Or whether they chose the chairs from Ikea or from, from Walmart? When we give, we should not give grudgingly or thinking that, you know, the decorating department didn't choose the kind of flowers that I suggested, so, so I won't give as much. We should give as if we're giving to God, because we are giving to God. In addition to uh, tithe, which belongs to God, what else does God ask for, uh, from his people? Tithe and? Tithe and offering, that's right. Malachi 3, verse 8, ascribe to the Lord the splendor he deserves. Bring an offering and enter his courts. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? So tithe has, no, has not been prescribed what percentage, has it? It has? Oh, tithe, yes. Okay. How about offering? Okay. So a man is to give according to, to, to his will. And yet, God says, ye have robbed me of tithes and offerings. Does it mean it's possible to rob God of offering? So even though that has been given up to us, it is possible. Now, should it matter, when you think about what offering you should give. There is probably two or three things that, you, you, that can guide you. God knows how much you earn, so, so you can't fool God. So number one, just make sure it's sacrificial. Number two, just realize who you are giving it to, they, who already knows what you're giving. Uh, how much should we give as offering? I think we already talked about this. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. So let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So what works uh, do, I'll explain a little bit of what, what does uh, offering do here. So we talked about tithe as something that goes to the conference and pays the pastors, we know the surplus that comes from tithe goes to, to help in other nations. Now, what does offering do? The offering, most of it stays here. It supports the lights that we have. Someone came to me and said, hey, it's kind of cold in here, can you do something about it? Uh, we pay for heating. And that heating is, is, comes from the offering. The, um, the snow plowing that goes outside. So when we come to church, there are certain comforts that we expect when we come here. And it's offering money that is being paid by someone else who is probably sitting next to you. Uh, that's paying it. Now, I am not perfect in my giving. That's not what qualifies me to stand up here. But I am moved to speak this message because it also preaches to me. Uh, I was going through an Amazing Facts uh, lesson online a uh, few months ago. It's about a 23-day lesson. And when this lesson came up of, of giving, it really struck me, and, and that's why I, I feel that I can share this with you today, because we can both benefit from it. 
what does God say will happen to those who knowingly rob? So we have determined that it's possible to, to rob God, right? So what's going to happen to them? Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me even this whole nation. And 1 Corinthians, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So stealing, we said it's robbing, right? He's calling, he's calling you a thief here as well. He's calling me a thief for not giving the offering. What does the Bible say about time management? So we've spoke, spoken quite a bit about the tithe, and I see a lot of faces are going down. So let's, let's move a little bit to time management. So what does the Bible teach about the time? We have determined in 1 Corinthians that everything belongs to God, even the breath of life that we have. So he can decide whether it is we've, bre- we've breathed enough and we can die anytime. I'm not trying to scare anyone, but this is reality, right? Our time here on earth is not, is not, is not guaranteed. You cannot say, yeah, I know I'm going to live for 50 years, so I can spend my time doing this now. We have no idea. And so here's what the Bible teaches about what we can do with the time that we have. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. So any chatter that you're having, whether it's gossiping or anything that is ungodly, you know what it is. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. So the NIV version says it differently and says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Whether you're at work, whether you're at school, Ellen White explains that if the time that we have was to, use, to be used in God's work or in, in reading, when you are in line at, at um, Superstore or when you go to the registry, that's the longest line I've been here in Fort McMurray. When you go in line at the registry, there was one day I, I went up there to, I think I was getting my, drive, my driver's license changed or renewed. I could see everyone in line was so frustrated, standing on one leg. After a few minutes, they stand on the other one, and you can see frustrated people. I remember this text that I had read from Ellen White and, uh, and did what she suggested. I went into some of Ellen White's books, and I started to read. The amount of information I gained while I was just standing there in line, it totally obliterated the fact that I was standing in line for an hour. I was literally standing for an hour. But sometimes when we have not gotten ourselves into this habit of reading scripture and spending our time wisely, we are more focused in spending it in being frustrated as to why is this registry so slow? Why are the people? But we can use this time more productively and enhance our own lives to get closer to God and read things that we can even share with others. So what is the greatest gift that we as individuals... So we've talked about time management. We've talked about, about money, giving back money. So what can we really... What's the best thing that you can say I can give to God? Proverbs chapter 23. My son, give me thy heart. And let thine eyes observe my ways. The people honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts are far away. So God, above all else, is asking that we give him his heart, our heart. And when we give God our hearts, everything that we 
lay our treasures in is going to be controlled by God. Luke 12, verse 34 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our hearts follow our investments. So wherever we put, whether it's our time, whether it's our money, that's where our hearts are. And so, remember Judas. Judas loved money so much. And what happened in the end? His heart was, his money, was with, with the money, and therefore he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. So we have to be careful where we put our hearts. So are you willing, by God's grace, to invite Jesus to be your partner by returning tithes and offerings and dedicating your time to him? And most of all, give him your heart? I hope your answer is yes here today, friends. If your answer is yes, please stand with us today as we sing our closing song number 327. I would rather have Jesus. Right. 